He was a pop star on a motorbike, on a Harley. He was rock and roll. There's only one evil can evil. But there was just something very cool about what he did. Evil can evil was the best. Is the best. He's just an extraordinary, unique person. In the 1970s, he was the Jack Flash who jumped through fire over bikes, cars, buses and trucks. Evil Knievel, the greatest, bravest, many would say most bonkers, daredevil showman ever. Oh, yes. There are two things that stand out in history. One is being a whore, a prostitute. The other is being a gladiator, spilling your blood. I am one of those two. People come to see me die. Yes, he was a gladiator, a leather-clad demigod who rode quite literally through the valley of death and packed out arenas across the world. Evil Knievel is most definitely an entertainer. He did what he did, not just for the money, but he did it because of the public acclaim that he got. Here was a man that turned 15 seconds into two and a half hours. You know, ostensibly a jump, which takes, you know, it's a few seconds down the ramp, that and however many seconds to crash and fall off it. He was the first one to do it the way he did. It was his style. He was someone that would ride up the ramp and down the ramp and do untold wheelies and then got on a different bike. Evil was all about the hype. Before a jump, he would just build up the anticipation. He would talk about it. It is just all about the moment. And if you can stretch that out and spin it out to that length of time, that's entertainment. was a guy who kind of looked at the situation and decided that the glory was better than the danger that he might face and just went for it. With his custom-made stars and stripes white suit, he was every inch the superstar, Elvis on a motorbike. And he loved America, preaching good old-fashioned values. It was no surprise he was the ultimate hero to the God-fearing blue-collar masses. Boy, I believe in God, and I pray every single day. I especially pray before I get ready to go on that jump. Praying was a useful pastime for the man who's broken 35 bones in his body, had 14 operations, and even been in a coma for 29 days. Evil Knievel, good luck to break a leg. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Thank Thank you. you. Evil Knievel was rebuilt regularly. And I suspect, probably, it's affected his brain a bit as well. I can't see that, that you know, if you're going to break up all your, the bits that you've got, you've probably broken your head a few times as well. And I can't believe that he's undamaged. I think it's quite fantastic that he's still alive. So, uh, why would you keep doing it? What you're asking me is the question, why? You can't answer that. You don't know why you do what you do, you don't know where you're going to go. You can just hope. Fair play, and it would seem jumping for America did indeed have its own reward. Jumping for America. Bill Jenkins. <laughs> yes, this was a man born of hardy stock. It was America, 1938, a country still reeling from the Great Depression. Bankruptcies, massive unemployment, and widespread poverty. The future looked less than perfect as Robert Craig Knievel arrived in Butte, Montana, in America's hard-bitten Midwest. My mother and dad were separated or divorced when I was six months old, and my grandparents raised me and were my mother and father, my mammy and pappy. Butte was a tough mining town near the Canadian border, and Bobby quickly learned how to survive here on his own streetwise wits. It's a real kind of hardcore brawling, drinking, brawling, falling over, getting up again, and, you know... I've broken my leg, doesn't matter, you get to work the next morning. Robert married his childhood sweetheart, Linda, in the autumn of 1959. Within a year, they had a son to support, and he started his own semi-pro hockey team, 
the Butte Bombers. This was just one of several really rubbish career moves. There was no money in hockey. It was my dream to be a pro hockey player. There was just no money in it. Evo had a checkered career, even before he became a daredevil. He did work down the local copper mine in Butte. He also would earn a few extra quid arm wrestling in the local bars. One of the things that he got involved in was safe breaking. A lot of us who were wise guys around this town, several of us, we learned to crack safes. We could crack a safe, blow a safe, peel a safe, anything. Well, the story is uh, he got hauled in by the local sheriff for stealing hubcaps and uh, his cells next door to some local hood called uh, Awful Canawful. Bill Awful Canawful was in this cell, and we put Bobby in this cell. We made the comment that now we got Awful Canawful and Evil Knievel. We're in for one hell of a night. With flagrant disregard for the rules of spelling, petty criminal Bobby awoke from his overnight stay in Chokey and renamed himself. I changed everything, changed Bob to evil. I remember going in a bar one night and seeing this businessman in there. He said, that's your pickup out in front? I said, yeah. He said, your name's Evil Knievel? I said, no, Evil Knievel. He said, that's a great name. I said, oh, nobody's ever heard of me. He said, they will someday, believe me. Spooky. Coming up in part two, Hard Up Evil gets out of jail, literally, and rides his nickname to fame, this time on the straight and narrow. Evil. Evil Knievel never made it as a pro hockey player. He never made it as a copper miner. He didn't even make it as a bank robber. In the end, he found his vocation in a childhood obsession, racing. Dead. Ouch! It was the end of the road for his stunt team. From now on, Ringmaster Knievel was to go it alone in a one-man, two-wheeled circus that would conquer the world. jump was the jump that made Evil Knievel the name that he became. He was the, uh, the modern P.T. Barnum. He knew how to create a stir. He managed to negotiate uh, this jump where he was going to leap over 151 foot across the fountains in front of Caesar's palace. He said, kid, you sure you can do this? I said, yeah, I can do it. He said, what do you want? I said, I want 5,000 a jump. He couldn't gauge how fast he needed to go prior to doing the jump. Normally a jumper will do a run up before and cut out the, the gas and actually make sure the bike's got enough momentum to keep it going. He couldn't do that, so he just, you know, barreled up the, the ramp. He took off at 70 miles an hour, soared 20 feet above the fountains and 44 feet to the landing ramp. Perfect. 
Except his landing wasn't. The jolt threw him from the bike, and Evil was immortalized on film, looking like a crash test dummy. Evil hit the brick wall at the end of the run and lost consciousness. Nobody knew if he would live or die. You could hear the roar of the crowd and the gasp of the crowd and so forth, and uh, you knew something bad had happened. Somehow the bike didn't land right, and he must have been hurt. But I didn't know really how serious he was hurt. Everybody was running around like mad. They were all uh, anxious to get up to see what was going on. They were concerned for his, his safety. When you hit on plywood and asphalt, it bites back, boy. It's not falling on a canvas or, or falling on AstroTurf or a football field. Asphalt is non-forgiving and just tears you to pieces. He was rushed to hospital where he lay in a coma for 29 days. That was the appeal of evil, the fact that he attempted these ridiculous jumps and then failed. So when evil can evil woke up, he woke up American hero. He's such a gambler, you never know whether he's going to pull off the jump or die. And uh, bet on red, it came out black. He still ended up winning. When you do what I do for a living, you have to have a positive mental attitude. And if that positive mental attitude doesn't work when you make that jump, you have to be man enough to handle the circumstances. In my case, I'm man enough. He would always carry a trophy from that defining crash, a trademark cane, the result of multiple hip operations. But he was, quite simply, too hard to stop jumping. I know I'm one tough son of a bitch. I know that. He called himself the last gladiator of the new Rome, which, you know, basically he wasn't going against a lot and he was going against death. Human beings are fascinated by anything which is not mundanity. The audience, you know the audience is, is going to be at the same time wanting him to succeed but also wanting him to, to come to a, a grisly end. People want to pay 10 or 15 dollars to go into a stadium and watch you break your legs or your pelvis. Of course, I mean it's not, you know, we term it now car crash but now of course it, there it was bike crash. It's not an exact science riding a bike and certainly jumping is not an exact science and uh, you know, there have been numerous deaths of, of jumpers since trying to emulate evil, and, um, you know, it is a, a dangerous business. Teddy Roosevelt said one time that it's better to try and win glorious triumphs and victories, even though you're checkered by failure and fate, than to rank with those poor spirits who neither enjoy victory or defeat because they've lived in such a great twilight that they've never tried either one. Three years later, Knievel was in Texas to make another career-defining jump, but physically, he was a very different man. Pretty much pinned together by nuts and bolts, but nothing was gonna stop this bionic biker. In order to, to do what he does, in order to, to completely overcome what for any of the rest of us would be a huge amount of anxiety, you have to build a tough shell around yourself and make yourself be that Mr. Invulnerable. Close to 100,000 people gathered at the Houston Astrodome to watch Evil Knievel attempt a new world record, jumping 11 cars and two trucks. Evil made the jump comfortably and set a new world record. His superstar status was sealed, and the cash came rolling in. He knew he'd really made it when permatanned Hollywood actor George Hamilton offered him $25,000 for the film rights to his story. It was a low-budget job, but grossed over $50 million, with 2.5% of the profits going to Knievel. Most lucrative of all, he joined forces with Ideal Toys to launch a series of action figures. Forget Buzz Lightyear or Tracy Island. Evil's stunt cycle was the must-have in every 70s toy cupboard. This is Evil Knievel and his stunt cycle. He's the only rider to do so many stunts. Mid-air somersaults. Ride straight. And for that big jump, Evil Knievel's the only one rough enough and tough enough. 
Evil Knievel's stunt cycle, it's ideal. For me it was the toy, and probably the only toy, every, if you talk Evil Knievel, you talk about the windy thing and, and the rather poor doll on the bike. I didn't really know who Evil Knievel was, but I had the Evil Knievel bike. And I could never afford them as a kid, the toys. Um, and I had to wait till I was a lot older, an adult in fact, to actually buy one. And now they're ten times as, as dear as they were back then. Like Evil Knievel, you would wind it up and it Voo! and would hit a wall, usually. And I don't know if that was built into the, the prototype that every time you use the toy, it smacked into a wall. Um, nice touch. Despite some obvious shortcomings, they sold in their millions. Knievel is estimated to have trousered over half a billion dollars from toy sales alone. My toy, the Evil Knievel toy with Ideal Toy, was the biggest selling toy in the history of the toy business. I outsold the Barbie doll and the G.I. Joe doll both one year. I have a letter from the chairman of the board of Toys R Us, a letter from the chairman of the board of Sears Roebuck. They said, Evil, it was a pleasure doing business with you in the 70s. You saved the toy industry. Children and their fathers and mothers knew what I was doing was for real. They believed in me. That's what sold that toy. To top it all off, the man now banking up to 15,000 bucks a jump was raking in still further royalties, endorsing other people's stuff. You're in the land of the merchandise, the spin-off, the cartoon series of the, you know, the inanimate object. It's just a bizarre world that, that those people inhabit anyway. And here is someone that gets up there and says, I love, I love this country, this great country, this land of the free. You've given me this opportunity to make an ass of myself and you don't mind, and I embrace you for that, and I'm wearing the stars and the stripes. You can do anything for a limited period of time. All of which meant ka-ching! And soon meant the rock and roll biker was living the full-on rock and roll superstar lifestyle. We lived in a trailer house for a long time, and uh, then the toys came out. And all of a sudden, we had uh, two Lear jets, three yachts, a nice home in Fort Lauderdale, a nice home here on the golf course. I've lived in uh, Los Angeles, Atlanta, Fort Lauderdale. I had 11 vessels in Fort Lauderdale, including a 124-foot fed ship and a 98-foot Broward, an 87-foot Broward, 54-foot Chris Craft. I had more cigarettes and magnums, and I couldn't even count them all. There was just a lot of things that happened overnight, it seemed like, in a period of four or five years. I had two jets sitting out here at the airport, two layers. I'd do anything I wanted to. If I wanted to go to New York for dinner, I'd go. Evil Knievel, at his peak, was spending money like water. He said, oh, I earned a billion, but I managed to spend two billion. You know, he was, he still managed to be in debt after earning so much, you know, from the jumps, from the merchandising. Sounds like fun, though. And it wasn't long before impressionable, thrill-seeking kids were gleefully ignoring the age-old advice, don't try this at home. Who's this guy on TV? The next thing he gets on his motorbike and he starts flying around. So I want to be him. Mum, I want to be him. There was a kid, he put on, he put on, on trees, a handmade a poster saying he was going to jump the brook at the point which it reached its widest. Um, wasn't that wise, probably about eight foot depth. The depth was probably only about a foot, but there were, it, it was mainly rocks and old mattresses and shopping trolleys. And, uh, and we all gathered, about 20 of us, to watch him jump the brook, um, thanks to Evil Knievel. And uh, like Evil Knievel, he too failed and plummeted to a very, very uh, painful end. We, we, we used to build ramps. You know what I mean? We used to build ramps, we used to jump cars. We used to do stuff like that, and as we got older, we stole motorbikes. So we used to steal motorbikes and think we were evil can evil. One copycat who took the imitations much more seriously was London boy Eddie Kidd. Eddie became the motorcycle jump world champion, but regrettably, this accident in 1996 left him with severely restricted speech. I based myself on can evil. I cobbled, I cobbled into a tee. One of my levers, on my belt buckle, I had the EK. On the sleeves and the cuffs, I had the E and K. I cobbled him, beat on 
Eddie Kidd was England's answer to evil. He was better than evil at jumping. I actually saw him, he did a show in Leatherhead, and I thought he was the best thing I'd ever seen. And he jumped 13 double-decker buses, evil jumped 13 single-deck. Much better jumper, far better jumper, a lot more class. But I think Eddie will tell you that uh, it was evil that got him into riding and got him into jumping. Evil Knievel was the best, is the best. So all the kids on the block were copying his antics. Sales of his stunt cycles were saving the toy industry. He was a fully-fledged megastar. Problem is, fully-fledged megastars often develop outsized egos, and Knievel was becoming increasingly outspoken. See, this is what money gives you, this is the slight delusions of grandeur, or the extreme delusions of grandeur, where you think you have the right to comment on other things and, and kind of, you don't. In one of Evil's outbursts, he publicly condemned the Hells Angels in a pre-jump speech. One of them threw a handily placed spanner at him, and the event erupted into a riot. There was about six or seven of them there in a the gang. When I got ready to make my last run, one of them was standing out there in the hallway where I came through the doors, and he threw a tire iron at me. Cops didn't even see him. He was out there in the hallway by himself. It hit me in the back, but I went on and made the run. I made the jump anyway. One, I was pissed. That crowd in that cow palace in San Francisco, California, a thousand of them came down on that floor, and they beat the hell out of those Hells Angels. Two of them were intensive care for six months. Just beat them half to death. Cops tried to protect them. They got hit in the face, they got hit, they got just blistered. So a happy ending there at least. Evil, it seemed, was completely at odds with the counterculture of 70s America. The Vietnam War was raging, and students protested and burnt the American flag, claiming all you need is love and drugs, but not evil. He was always very anti-drugs. It was part of his um, all-American apple pie image. Some of them cheat a little bit to get ahead and they use a nitro and their car runs for about five laps and then it blows all the hell and that's what will happen to you in life if you take narcotics you'll run for five laps and you will blow all the hell so the decision is yours you make it i never have taken a drug unless prescribed by a doctor in my entire life and i'm proud of it i admit i did drink too much you know we all have vices but uh Never got into the drug scene, ever. I consider myself very lucky. Say no to drugs. I don't, I've never taken them, and I throw myself over double-decker buses and crash. But I don't do drugs. Maybe you should. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, what condition my condition was in. On the surface, this clean-cut, all-American hero was pure cool and bravado. In fact, as he squared up to each new challenge, there was a drug of sorts putting the fire in his belly. Evil doesn't shy away from the fact that he's always liked to drink. Um, he used to keep a cane with a secret stash of wild turkey in it that he used to take a nip from uh, just before he did a jump. On the one hand, you think, is he a great dreamer? Is he, a, you know, does he embody what we all feel? No, what he's also full of is alcohol and an awful lot of it swirling around his body for years. But I don't think it was a big problem for him, the fact he liked to drink. It was just part of his lifestyle. It probably helped him relax before a jump and also after a jump. This is, this is his, dem his demise. I mean, it was, was alcohol related, coupled with the multiple injuries and broken bones. But the alcohol, a lot of liquor, hard liquor, hard drinking. This man who goes around talking about how he's anti-drugs and anti-bad things, if you look at his history, that's not the real evil can evil. The, the real him is probably far more like the evil bit that uh, he gives to his name. Crikey. Perhaps this explains how, one night on a drinking binge, he dreamt up his most outlandish stunt to date. And it's coming up in part three. I went to... Idaho, and I bought a canyon. It's my canyon. And on September the 8th, I'll jump it. And the only way they'll get me out of the air is to shoot me out with an anti-aircraft gun, because I am going to go.
By the 70s, Evil Knievel had become a huge draw, commanding $15,000 a jump, but his taste for the finer things in life pushed him to pack out his schedule with more and more stunts, some unnecessarily risky. The money that Evil was earning back in the 70s, he didn't actually need to jump a lot of the time because he was earning so much from his endorsements and his toys. I think there was something in him as a person. He wanted the respect of people. The buzz that you get out of going up a ramp, going over with thousands and thousands of people watching you and hoping, well, probably hoping that you'll do okay, but also e equally as interested in hoping that you splatter yourself on the, on the ramp at the other side. That buzz must be intoxicating. This jump over 13 huge Pepsi delivery trucks to promote a local delivery company was ambitious, even by Knievel standards. Oh dear. Evil was thrown from his bike like one of his own toys, hitting the tarmac at 80 miles an hour. This time he was lucky, only smashing his collarbone and breaking an arm. Evil paid the price for his uh, daredevil actions. He's uh, broken 35 different bones, had 14 different operations. Evil Knievel's always appeared to have a death wish which does seem to suggest it's a bit of a miracle that he's still here today. If you told him he couldn't or he wouldn't be well in six months, well, you know, with just in a few weeks, it was as if it never happened. And um, he would take his, his cast off early, they'd say six months, he'd have it on five weeks and it'd be off. Looking back, it's incredible Knievel survived at all. His bike of choice, the Harley-Davidson XR750, was simply not built for jumping, which is a bit daft, really. The bikes that he was jumping on it shouldn't go two feet off the ground, let alone 20 feet. I mean, a Harley-Davidson is a big bike. This is not the worst bike in the world to be attracted any kind of stunt on. They're just shit bikes. But that's evil for you, aren't they? Every time you jump, you see a crash. This, this is the bench in which crap. The guy is the guy with the top of the end of us. The bikes weren't made for jumping. 750 SR, two turvy, turvy. It should not be wheelied, it should not be jumped. They're monsters. They are, they're massive. They're too far to have, you know. He definitely is a daredevil. You know, he grit his teeth, go as fast as he could and hope for the best. I mean, that was, that was all he did. There was no um, technique there. There was, uh, apart from the fact that he was actually doing it and holding on. Early in 72, Evil returned to San Francisco's Cow Palace, scene of the earlier Hells Angels fracas, where 15,000 watched him attempt an extremely hazardous indoor jump. Everybody in that cow palace knew that he, there was no way he was going to make that jump. Number one, no power. Number two, the distance. Against all the odds and against all the advice of everyone around you, you're going to hit yourself. You're going to, you're going to go through those two pillars. There isn't enough um, landing area, so you're going to hurt yourself. What do you do? People are paid money. You're not going to back out because you're going to lose money. So what do you do? You have, you, you have a few drinks. <laughs> hey, I'll cycle home. I don't care. We've all done it. He finally did it. Made the jump, but the tire on that bike blew. He went through these pillars, bounced off of a couple of pillars. I went down there. He's bleeding from the nose, the ears, everything. And they haul him off to the hospital. In the hospital, I see if you knew you couldn't make it. You, didn't, the, you never had the power on the bike. You had everything against you. He says, Ferda, what the hell do you think I was supposed to do, give them their money back? <laughs>
serious dangers, Evil still encouraged his kids to follow their all-American dad into the daredevil world. And he was very much the proud father when he introduced them to the public in Toronto in the summer of 74. And I would like you to meet my sons, Kelly and Robert. Dressed in leathers just like their dad, Kelly 14 and Robbie 12 entertained the crowd with wheelies around the arena. But the highlight of the evening was Dad's announcement of his most outrageous stunt ever. Dreamt up, not entirely surprisingly, on a drinking binge. I went to Idaho and I bought a canyon. It's my canyon. And on September the 8th, I'll jump it. And the only way they'll get me out of the air is to shoot me out with an anti-aircraft gun because I am going to go, believe me. Evil had apparently been planning this stunt for over seven years, but after being refused permission to jump the Grand Canyon, Knievel leased land at an alternative site. All right, I'll buy the canyon just so I can jump it in a rocket no one says will work. I mean, it's just this desperation to keep yourself at that level. It's quite fantastic, but utterly, utterly laughable. Now this canyon was pretty big, it's, uh, it was uh, 500 foot wide, quarter of a mile deep and um, this time Evil decided that he was going to jump it not in a motorcycle but in something he called the Sky Cycle. September the 4th, 1974. For Evil, Judgment Day had come. He was under enormous pressure from the press and public alike. The big question was, would he make it? They came from all over the country to, to see this clown who was going to jump over the Snake River uh, in a, what, a Skymobile, which was nothing more than a big firecracker, it would, and, and he was sitting on it. Now, there were three different sky cycles actually built, and uh, before the jump, two of them were dead and buried at the bottom of this canyon. So they, every time he had practiced this jump, it had failed. They decided that the electronics wasn't going to get the job done and it had to go to a manual deal with Knievel. I mean, he had to push the red button. And he had a lot of instructions that led up to pushing that button. Basically, they wanted to cancel and He said, no, we're not canceling. We're going to go. What could I do? I gave my word I'd do it to the public. You know what a real daredevil is? That's a guy that gives his word to his friends or to the public or whatever that he's going to do something. Evil admits now that the, uh, the canyon jump was the scariest one that he ever attempted and he wasn't sure he was going to make it. Um, and before this one, he said to himself, God take care of me, here I come. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. The parachute mechanism released almost instantly after the takeoff, so it was a massive anticlimax as he wafted down into the canyon. I blacked out, and then when the parachute opened, I had a red out where all the blood came out of my ears and my nose and my eyes and my mouth, and I thought certainly I would drown. I mean, I was going right down in the middle of the river. It's going to crash, obviously into the river. Miraculously, the sky cycle drifted into land, bounced off a ledge, and eventually landed on a rocky bank, only 20 feet from the river's edge. Evil was rescued by an enormous plank of wood and brought back to terra firma, much to the relief of his family. Some skeptics claimed Evil had no intention of reaching the other side of the canyon and had released the parachute on purpose. Surely the greatest daredevil of them all wouldn't dupe his public? Let me ask you something. If I'd have made it, everybody said it was easy. If I'd have got killed, I'd have been dead. Come up to see me, make me smile. Poor old Knievel. He just couldn't win. Possibly thinking the English would treat him better, he packed his leathers and headed off to London. Well, when the Wembley show was put together, no one knew really who Evil was. I mean, they'd read about him jumping Snake River. But um, he came over and I think the tour was going pretty badly. And um, Evil did what Evil does, which is basically jump in a car and drive on the wrong side of the road. 
Um, he did a couple of TV appearances, he did a press conference, and I think the English people thought, who's this nut? Well, I know that you brought quite a few uh, of your bikes over here. How many altogether? Well, I have a half a dozen with me on the sky cycle that I jumped the canyon with. Uh -huh. Well, first of all, if we could take a look at one of the bikes, which, uh, what is it, the 750? This is a 750 Harley Davidson. And it, uh, uh, runs about 135, 140 miles an hour. A rather powerful machine. I was absolutely delighted when I knew I was going to interview him because that's right, I, I admired him. The problem was that he had decided that he was going to come on Blue Peter and it was going to be his show. And we said, wait a minute, wait, no, no. At the most, it's five minutes. It's probably really only five. Oh, five. It's not worth me turning up. And I said, well, this is what we do. If we don't do it this way, we ain't going to do it. Of course, it wasn't my prerogative to say that. And he, he was carrying a cane which had a, a bulbous end, and on the end of this was a diamond motorbike. And he stuck this under my nose. He said, you see that? I could buy this whole studio with that. And I said, so what does that prove? We're still doing it our way or not at all. At which point, he stormed out of the studio. I am a professional life risker. I think the best piece of advice that I could give to any young person or anyone riding a motorcycle is don't be a fool. Don't ever ride a motorcycle without a helmet. Next time I saw him, we were on air, and he did it absolutely by the book and it was fine. No problem at all. I'm going to announce a Thursday, and I will let you know, I'm going to make a jump in Wembley Stadium, bigger than I've ever made in my life, and I'll let you know, Peter. Well, as they say in Circus is Evil can evil. Good luck, break a leg. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thanks Thank for you. having me on. 26th of May, 1975, and we Brits welcome Evil can Evil to our world-famous Wembley Stadium. It proved to be a momentous night, after a fashion. Wembley jump didn't go well. Evil attempted to jump 13 red single-decker London buses and uh, the stadium was packed out and uh, true to form, Evil fudged the landing again and uh, somersaulted over the handlebars, uh, fracturing and breaking you know, bones and pelvises. Everything was going well and he's just, and you think he's about to do it and like one inch of his wheel just clips the last bus, do you know what I mean? And he just goes flying. He, fly, he, he flies for about 25 metres along the ground and just goes straight into this advertising hoarding. You can see as he's coming down the ramp, he's not going fast enough. He's, he's um, definitely uh, lucky to even make it onto the 13th bus. Despite sustaining a fractured pelvis and broken hand, Knievel insisted on getting to his feet and talking to the hushed audience. They weren't expecting what came next. Ladies and gentlemen of this wonderful country, I've got to tell you that you are the last people in the world who will ever see me jump, because I will never, ever, ever jump again. Evil's career as stunt daredevil biker was over. The UK tour of Britain cancelled. Great to have all that footage and all those memories, because, you know, that was the last of, the last of that, really. Coming up in part four, more injuries. Only this time, it's not Evil on the receiving end. That judge is a good judge. Ladies and gentlemen of this wonderful country, I've got to tell you that you are the last people in the world who will ever see me jump, because I will never, ever, ever jump again. Pants on fire. Still, what's a broken promise after so many broken bones, eh? Yes, within months, Evil Knievel was back, leaping 14 Greyhound buses in Cincinnati, and at 133 feet, it was the longest crash-free jump of his career. 
um, even when he crashed after Wembley Stadium and uh, was heard on the microphone to say, you've seen me jump for the last time, he had to jump again. Evil wasn't able to go out on a, on a downer. He had to go out on something to prove that he was the tough person that he wanted to, everyone to think that he was. By now, his star was on the wane. A detour into acting with 1977's Viva Knievel, a dodgy smuggling caper, proved a complete flop. Things went into total career tailspin that same year when he learned his ex-publicist Sheldon Saltman had written the warts and all book, lifting the lid on our all-American hero's darkest secrets. A pretty dangerous move, given Evil's infamously short fuse. Hey. God damn it. Quiet! Go out there and tell him I said shut up. Sheldon wrote this biography of Evil Knievel outlining you know, his womanizing, his drinking. But he also talked about uh, Evil Knievel being addicted to drugs. And um, Knievel being the all-American hero didn't take lightly to that. I went to the 20th Century Fox parking lot and I took the ball bat with me and I hit him as hard as I could on the wrists. Nowhere else but just on the wrists. I said, now you will never write another book with those broken wrists. You've got skeletons in your closet. I mean, you know, probably joined together by pins. But it's an odd, it, it, it seems a real knee-jerk reaction to do that. He's quite a sinister cat as well, ruthless. He's the sort of person who doesn't consider the outcomes of his actions. You and I wouldn't jump over large amounts of buses because we would too strongly consider the outcomes of our actions. Evil, on the other hand, just knows what he wants to do and he goes and does it. Well, Evil got sentenced uh, to three years for that. But he, he only ended up se serving six months. He lost his hero status. I only have one thing to say about this day in court. That judge is a good judge, and he's a fair judge. I have nothing more to say. I mean, I suppose he's sticking to his principles. Yeah, and if he said it again, I'd slap him down. Did, did he not have lawyers? I mean, did he not have advisors that just went, shut the, please, just shush, shush, leave it. Leave it. It ruined him. It ruined him. But the real sentence for evil was the complete tarnishing of his reputation. He lost the deal with Ideal Toys, and um, when he came out of prison, really, the bubble had burst and no one cared about Evil Knievel anymore. After his release from jail, there was no longer any demand for evil's daredevil stunts. Harley Davidson and his other once lucrative sponsors dumped him. I finally quit completely in 1980. Could not pull a trigger anymore. I, I, I just thought about hitting a bus or a truck or a car head on with that motorcycle and it just took the life out of me, the desire. So I got away from it. I fished, hunted, played golf, traveled, uh, went through a divorce. His marriage was also ruined by this decline. The years of heavy drinking and open womanizing. A new man he wasn't. I was not put here on the face of this earth to satisfy a woman or her wants. I feel that I've been a success because I took a chance and I told my wife if she wanted to be my wife, she was going to go along with it. She has gone along with it. Linda ran away. Their 38-year-old marriage legally ended in December 97. But Knievel did piece his private life back together. He was already dating golf pro Crystal Kennedy, 33 years his junior. They eventually married in front of the fountains at Caesar's Palace, the scene of his first major jump 31 years before. She put up with the drinking, the bleeding esophagus, the staph infection, the hip transplants, the temperament, and the liver transplant. The guy's got to take 48 pills a day, basically because he's had diabetes, he's had to have a liver transplant, so he's not feeling too happy at the moment. So I think she makes sure he takes his pills and gives him a bit of a, you know, a bit of a tender care. Despite his failing health, Knievel, now in his mid-sixties, regularly boasts of making one last jump. When I make this last jump, believe me, I'm going to come at it so fast, if you blink, you're going to miss me.
I'm going to take off and I'm going to be so high and go so far, you'll wonder where the hell I went. He said, maybe I'll just jump over a whole row of naked women and uh, line them up, what was it, uh, ramp to ramp, rump to rump, and then when I land, I'll get a nice soft landing, which uh, sums evil up quite nicely.